$100,000 per year. Back when I was in high school, that was the ultimate benchmark for making it and being considered rich. However, as of recent, close to 50% of people that have a six-figure salary are actually living paycheck to paycheck. And this is a pretty controversial topic as of late. Is 100K per year still a lot of money or are people just worse with their money? There are a lot of factors that we can dive into to try to answer this question, but let's actually start with wage growth. If wages aren't growing at a fast enough pace, then basically what that means is that $100,000 per year is still considered quite a lot of money. Because if we think about it, if the opposite were true and wages were growing really quickly, if everybody made $300,000 per year, then yeah, $100,000 per year doesn't seem like that much. So are wages growing fast enough? Let's look at the data. In 1980, American families had a median income of $75,672 in today's currency, according to the US Census. However, three decades later, that has actually dropped to $70,780 four dollars as of the 2021 census data. So wages are basically stagnant and there are actually plenty of examples to back this up. You can see by this graph right here that for the lower and middle class wages, their wages have only gone up about five and six percent since 1979 versus those in the 95th percentile or the top five percent of all wage earners have seen their wages go up considerably more at 41 percent. Part of the reasons for this according to researchers at Kellogg School of Business is a phenomenon called labor market concentration. That means if you're someone that works at a factory, let's pretend you make water bottles and let's say you work at a factory in Memphis, Tennessee. One day you get pissed about your pay and your benefits and you think to yourself, man, I'm gonna go find a new job at a new water bottle factory in my area. But the problem here is at this point, there are no other competitors in the Memphis, Tennessee area where you can just all of a sudden switch to. That means you're gonna be stuck at your current place of employment, your employer has all the leverage, and the wage that you are going to have to take is the one that you can get. This wasn't just a theory either. The researchers actually looked at over 300,000 manufacturing plants in the United States across a certain longer period of time. And what they found was, was when the employers actually had leverage, that means they could actually afford to pay lower wages. My hypothesis as to why you're not seeing this with higher wage workers is that higher wage workers are typically more skilled in knowledge work. And so that means they can get away with the freedom of applying to almost any employer across the country and work remotely in a post pandemic world. But back to our topic at hand, if $100,000 per year still should seem like $100,000 per year because wages are stagnant, why doesn't it feel that way for some people? It actually comes down to the cost of living increases that we've seen over time, as well as the inflation that we've recently been experiencing. So there are five major categories for cost of living that we should look at, in my opinion, to assess whether or not 100K is still worth 100K. These are all going to be really big costs in anybody's lives. So housing, healthcare, transportation, insurance, as well as school tuition. This particular article pulled data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and actually found that spending $100,000 on a home in 1990 would equate to spending $377,000 on a home today. So in terms of housing, while we're seeing that the change in consumer prices have been going up steadily over time, as we can see with this darker blue line right here, home prices have been outpacing that considerably. Basically $100,000 back in 1990 is worth $377,000 today. So if we were looking at six figure salaries from a housing perspective only, then the six figure salary of $100,000 per year is no longer what it used to be. In terms of healthcare, that industry has just grown incredibly since 1960. So back in 1960, we spent about 5% of our nation's GDP on healthcare alone. But these days, health spending accounts for close to 20% of the nation's GDP. That just kind of shows you how big the healthcare industry has gotten. Out-of-pocket healthcare costs have increased roughly 27% adjusted for inflation since 1990. So that's not getting any cheaper and adds to the burden of basically living life. One of the biggest burdens to the household is also transportation costs. So if you guys have been keeping track on my channel, you'll know that the average car payment these days is $716 per month for new cars and $526 a month for used cars. The average car loan term is now 69.44 months, which is close to six years. And 81% of consumers buying a new car are actually going to get financing for it. That's leading to auto loan debt at historic all-time highs at 1.5 
$1.5 trillion in the nation itself. Personally, I was thinking about getting a new car until I started making all these videos about cars and realizing how much of wealth killers they actually are. So I've actually decided to just hold on to my current car, which has already paid off. I'm just gonna run it into the ground as that's the best financial decision for me. In addition to this, I'm sure that you guys have noticed that gas prices are not going down either. They seem to be high across the board, even in states where they're typically lower. I was in North Carolina last week, and when I was just driving through and just looking at all the gas station prices, they were close to about $3.30 per gallon, which I thought was quite high for the South. I'm sure Europeans will still say that this is dirt cheap compared to their crazy gas prices over there. So if you are European, let me know how much they are in the comments. But uh, for now, let's actually go through the car insurance prices because insurance is also getting expensive too. Between 1990 and 2020, car insurance had an average inflation rate of 3.8% per year. And so an auto insurance policy costing $500 in 1990 cost $1,587 in 2021 for the same vehicle and coverage. Overall inflation was 2.36% during the same period. So car insurance premiums are also outpacing inflation. Other types of insurance costs are also increasing. So if you have a home, you likely have homeowner's insurance and actually it's gotten more expensive. I can only find data from 2001 to 2019 on this topic, but the average premiums for home homeowners insurance from this period have more than doubled. Now, one of the biggest costs that we all face is actually the cost of education. And this is a really crazy stat here, but in terms of tuition over the past 30 years from 1991 to 2021, average tuition prices have more than doubled. Average tuition prices at a public four-year institution are close to $11,000 per year now, and at a private institution, that's close to $38,000 per year. I went to the University of Washington in Seattle for the first two years of undergrad before I transferred due to playing too much World of Warcraft, but back in the day, the tuition prices were $26,000 a year for not only tuition, but also room and board. That's a true story, by the way. I, I did like leave you dumb because I played too much WoW. I ran that number through an inflation calculator and $26,000 back then is worth $40,000 today. So my yearly tuition was $40,000. And here's the gross part. I actually went to the University of Washington's website a little bit earlier today. And I actually looked at how much tuition costs now. And these days we're looking at $64,000 per year out of state, which is just, that's just crazy. It's crazy to spend that much to go to Seattle because you're just gonna be sitting inside for half the year because it rains so much. So spending on these five major categories have really gone up considerably over the past 30 years. Now, if you pair that with inflation sitting at between four to 8% per year for the past few years, everyday living costs are also getting expensive too. According to the research, quote, $100,000 spent on goods and services in 1990 would require $231,081 to get the same amount of goods today. But if you've gotten this far in this video, you know that this doesn't tell the entire picture. $100,000 per year year salary is going to depend on where you live as well. So is the six figure salary still considered rich? We're going to answer that. But first, in order to actually harness the power of your money and make sure you're maximizing your savings potential, I want to tell you about how today's sponsor SoFi can help you do so. If you open a checking and savings account with them, any money that you put into your high yield savings account can earn you up to 4.30% APY, which is a whopping 11 times the national average savings rate. For context, that means with SoFi and direct deposit, you'd earn more interest in just five weeks than you would in an entire year with other banks. They also offer up to an additional $2 million in FDIC insurance on deposits, which is eight times more than the standard $250,000. So I did a little digging on how they do this and they actually do it through a network of participating banks. The same way it would be if you went ahead and just manually opened up a bunch of bank accounts at different banks, they just do it seamlessly and automatically for you and you can still access all of your cash through SoFi. There are also no account fees and up to a $250 bonus when you open an account and sign up for direct deposit. I think the nicest part of SoFi is that since it's a nationally chartered bank, you get a full suite of banking services. So quite literally, they are an all-in-one finance app that can help you with anything that a traditional bank would. Sign up for your own account today by going to the following link, sofi.com slash Humphrey, and I'll also link it down below. And thank you to SoFi for sponsoring this video. Now, one of the lowest cost of living places in the entire United 
states where $100,000 goes the furthest is actually Memphis, Tennessee. You see how I interlooped that from the earlier part of this video? It's also followed by a bunch of cities in Texas. So this website, Smart Asset, they used a paycheck calculator to get the after-tax income, and then they compared that across 76 different cities and adjusted it for the cost of living using data from multiple sources. Since Memphis, Tennessee has a cost of living that is 14% lower than the national average, your money goes further there, and according to their calculations, $100,000 in Memphis, Tennessee, the after-tax earnings are worth $86,444 there. El Paso, Texas, and Oklahoma City, Oklahoma are actually number two and number three, respectively. Now, when I told some of my friends, hey, Memphis, Tennessee is actually one of the lowest cost of living cities to live in, they retorted, yeah, but then you're in Memphis, Tennessee. And while I did somewhat agree with them there, if you're from Memphis, Tennessee, let me know in the comments, how is it there? I would argue that $100,000 per year is still viewed as a coveted salary and a really good thing to aspire to in a lower cost of living city or state. But as you go down the full list, which I will link down below, you'll start to notice that the $100,000 in take home pay starts to decrease as cost of living increases. And so famously, you get to the end of the list, which includes New York, San Francisco, Honolulu, and D. DC, Washington DC as the four worst places where your money can go. There's a thread on Reddit of people comparing their cost of living situations with a $100,000 per year salary. And here are some of the most popular responses. Number one, 100K in Pittsburgh PA is fine, but in San Francisco, it's poverty according to Commercial Tell 2504. Being located in San Francisco myself, I would say that $100,000 per year is not poverty per se. However, the average rent of a one bedroom in San Francisco is $3,000 per month or $36,000 per year. That means in housing alone, that could account for close to 50% of the take home pay of $100,000 per year, which is pretty crazy. That also means that you just won't have any discretionary income at your disposal if you live in a really high cost of living area. Now back to our friend in Memphis, Tennessee, that's our favorite city anyways. The average rent there for a one bedroom is $1,069. So on just rent difference alone, you're looking at a difference of $2,000 from a low cost of living area to a high cost of living area. And that could be a huge factor on if you consider yourself rich or not. It's not that much better in other parts of the country either. So this reply, this person pays more than 30K for daycare and 20K for healthcare in New Jersey. Now, the top reply is actually quite funny. 30K for daycare is nuts. I hope your kids are learning piano at that MFKR. That's pretty accurate, but she does say that these are typical prices for New Jersey, according to parenting forums. Now, lastly, this response from this person who lives in Los Angeles, a high cost of living area, says that 100K per year is a livable income, but it's not rich anymore. So the takeaway here is that if you live on any of the coasts or any high cost of living area, you're likely going to have to earn way more to feel that same level of richness that $100,000 per year might have gotten you, let's say 30 years ago. For many people that I talked to, it was close to $150,000 to $200,000 per year in a really high cost of living city like San Francisco or New York. According to the data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you'd have to make $129,000 today to have the same purchasing power that a salary of $100,000 per year got you a decade ago. Growing up, I always wanted to make $100,000 per year. Now, does saying to yourself, man, I wanna make $129,000 or man, I want to make $150,000 per year. Does that have the same ring to it? Probably not. But the reality is, is that these days you're gonna need a lot more than $100,000 per year to be considered rich, unless you live in a super low cost of living area. By the way, thanks again to our sponsor SoFi. Make sure to take advantage of their high yield savings accounts with a link down below.